several presentations that were of interest. The one that was most interesting to me was one of mine, actually, uh, which was oral strategy. An oral strategy was a non-inferiority trial of tofacitinib, the JAK312, now approved around the world. And what it looked at was the whether or not tofacitinib plus methotrexate was equivalent to adalimumab plus methotrexate, whether tofacitinib monotherapy was equivalent to tofacitinib plus methotrexate, and whether tofacitinib monotherapy was equivalent to tofacitinib plus ad plus, uh, versus adalimumab plus methotrexate. And it was designed as a non-inferiority trial. And what we found was, was that tofacinib plus methotrexate is non-inferior to adalimumab plus methotrexate. So what this means is, in a group of patients who are methotrexate incomplete responders, whether you add tofacinib or whether you add adalimumab, you would get the same effect. They're non-inferior. Uh, we did test, because we met the non-inferiority, whether one was superior to the other statistically, and they weren't. So they're basically equivalent. Just as important as that, so you know that you can use a, a JAK inhibitor instead of a biologic if you wanted to, was whether or not tofacinib monotherapy was non-inferior to tofacinib plus methotrexate. Because in the phase three tri trials, it actually looked like the monotherapy was more effective. But it turns out that when you do the real head-to-head, -head, the monotherapy is not non-inferior. I didn't say it's inferior, I said it's not non-inferior, which means that in a group of patients, the best thing to do would be to add tofacinib to methotrexate, not switch methotrexate to tofacinib, and if the patient did very well, then you could stop the methotrexate. And you'll find that a majority of patients can stop methotrexate, but in groups of patients, more will do better with the combination. And the third part was looking at adalimumab plus methotrexate versus the monotherapy. The same thing was found as with tofacinib. The monotherapy is not non-inferior, but it's just not non-inferior. So the conclusion really is, is in a group of patients, best thing to do in a methotrexate incomplete responder is either add tofa or add adalimumab. But if you want to use monotherapy, then you would do tofa, and after the patient reaches a, a remission, you would then stop the methotrexate. You'd be able to do that in most. So that was very important because we're using a lot more tofa around the world. Uh, the second one that was interesting was actually a negative study. And it was a study of a nanobody. A nanobody is a small protein. It's an IL-6 inhibitor, all right? Uh, and in this study, uh, they presented their primary results at the Canadian rheumatism meeting, which is unusual. Usually these primary results are presented at either UR or ACR. Um, and what we saw, though, that, but they showed the results. And the results were it failed. The drug failed. It failed versus placebo with a placebo response that was very high, placebo response in the 60s, right? And with the drug, any, any um, uh, dose of the drug, the drug was in the, about 70, but it's not statistical. They started 20, 50, 70. And then the question was, why did they have such a high placebo response? So they did an analysis, which I would like to see in many more studies, and it turns out that when they went to sites, investigative sites, in countries where biologics are available, the drug actually worked. The placebo response was, was lower. The response in, with the drug was the same as what we saw, and it was and it achieved in HR20. And if you went to sites in countries where biologics are not available, the placebo response was 80%, and there was no difference between the drug. And this is a very important concept, too, well, two reasons. Number one, is this a drug that is going to be valuable? Should it be developed? Should the company spend millions and millions of dollars to develop it when it failed in phase two because of where they did the study? And the second is, is many com companies now 
do studies in South America, parts of Eastern Europe, parts of Asia, where there isn't a lot of access to biologics. That's where they find the patients, and that's where they find results like this. So the question is, is what are they going to do? They're going to take more time to find patients, which is what they would have to do, or they're going to waste their money, as they have, and do this in countries where they can find patients who are inappropriate and get inappropriate results. So in terms of clinical studies, this is really very, very important. And the third is, is we have one JAK inhibitor that's approved around the world, which is tofacitinib. We have a second, which is baricitinib, which is approved in many parts of the world, but not everywhere. And we have two others in development. Um, tofacitinib is a JAK312, baricitinib is a 1-2. They look very, very similar. Uh, the other two are supposed to be JAK1 selective. The safety profile of one of the JAK1 selectives, Fogadanib, was actually shown in, in, in this meeting. And it suggests that Fogadanib does have a different safety profile than the other two JAKs. And the efficacy may be the same. We'll have to see what happens in the, in the phase three program, but it may turn out that actually in terms of the JAKs, there may be difference, differences clinically that we see, whether it's safety, whether it's efficacy, based upon the JAK specificity. And this is a question we've been asking ourselves for years. So this raises the, the, the real possibility that there may be a difference, but we'll see when they do the full phase three program. So in terms of practicing physicians, there are messages. So in, with respect to tofacitinib and the oral strategy, what it suggests is, is if you want to use an oral medication, which you might well be able to use as a monotherapy, you can use tofacitinib rather than adalimumab, rather than TNF. You, you really do have that choice. And we've seen the same thing with baricitinib, so we know that's probably true of the class. So that's an important point for the practicing physician. Second important point is, is if you have a patient as a methotrexid incomplete responder, add a jack before you withdraw the methotrexate, don't switch. The second point that for the practicing physician is when you see trial results, you really have to take a look at the methods. Where was the study done? What were the endpoints? Uh, how, how stringent were they? What is the study really telling you? Don't just read the abstract, just don't read the conclusion. Don't just listen to what the company is telling you. You really have to read the methods and the results because you'll get a very different picture from what you may see if you just see a summary. And then the third is, is, is as we watch the development programs of the, new, of the dr new drugs in rheumatoid arthritis, there may be hints about differences where you really can select one versus the other as opposed to what we do with the TNFs where you can pick one or the other, it doesn't make much of a difference. So, ULAR does meet my expectation. I, I expect that if there's a dynamite new study that's going to be um, uh, released, it, it may be released here. Um, and there were a few that were released here. Um, there are a lot of posters, there are a lot of presentations, um, so you really can get a pretty general view of what's happening. Um, there are a lot of um, lectures, special lectures, where you get opinions, and they really are opinions, um, but you can take it or leave it. Uh, but yeah, I think Euler does meet my expectations. It's a worthwhile meeting to go to.